Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks uh, to everyone joining us today. Um, hope everyone is staying safe under the circumstances. Welcome to today's uh, CNCF webinar, the Rosetta Stone Guide to Compliance in a Cloud Native World. I'm Sanjeev Rampal, Principal Engineer at Cisco and a CNCF Ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar. We would like to welcome our presenter today. Cynthia Burke is a Program Manager at Capsulate. Uh, before we get started, a few quick housekeeping items. During the webinar, you are not able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can uh, during and after the presentation. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or the questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful of your fellow participants and performers. Uh, as, a, as we said earlier, put your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat box. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Cynthia to kick off today's presentation. Go ahead, Cynthia. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for those who joined and welcome to the Rosetta Stone Guide to Compliance in a Cloud Native World. I'm Cynthia, I'm a program manager at Capsule 8, and I am one of those people who actually reads about compliance because I find it interesting. It may or may not be a medical condition, we, we will see. Um, but we are here to talk about compliance today, and unlike me, it may not be one of your favorite subjects. In fact, it may feel like a massive box checking exercise pulling in staff and coworkers into this vast abyss, mapping arcane controls, deciphering audit speak, and never really sure if you're even shoring up security. But you know it's important and you don't wanna make the headlines. But every time an auditor speaks, there seems to be a letter or a sentence describing a compliance control, which may or may not cost you thousands but I promise you the auditor on the other side of the table is equally as lost when you start talking about orchestration tools or containers or images. So how can you, the IT expert, quickly tease out the essence of what an auditor needs to give them the confidence that you've passed an audit? What's the solution? Today, we're going to dig in and decipher a SOC 2 type one audit in a cloud native environment. We're gonna demystify all the dots and the dashes and control numbers and give a high level actionable roadmap of key elements required to pass your own SOC 2 audit, regardless of where you are on your cloud native or compliance journey. And in truth, you're likely already tackling SOC 2 problems and you may not even realize it. You may be working right now on looking at your processes and documentation for your stakeholders to demonstrate how you are managing in this new normal. Security of the cloud versus security in the cloud. We've been talking about these, these phrases for a long time, but they've come to take on an entirely different meaning in the context of compliance. It's nuanced, but it's critical in the first step on the roadmap. A decade ago, we worried about stability and accessibility and whether or not cloud was the right place for critical systems and applications. We talked a lot about security of the cloud and then struggled once we got there of how to ensure security in the cloud. But through the lens of present day, security of the cloud now speaks to the shared responsibility model. Mapping out the who in terms of responsibility when it comes to producing audit evidence in cloud native deployments is a tricky first step. And it speaks volumes to just how significantly discussions around security and compliance have shifted in a cloud native world. So how did a fairly straightforward endeavor, an audit, become that monster under the bed, that thing that looms over us and few understand? I'm going to give an incredibly brief history of SOC, how SOC 2 came to be seen as the gold standard for compliance attestations for service organizations. 
So for years, the AICPA, that's the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, performed what was called a SAS 70 audit of service control organizations. And among these controls included security controls. But keep in mind, this is an accounting organization. Nevertheless, SAS 70 started being leveraged as an asset to win and keep business. But the controls weren't really sufficient to assess IT organizations. So in 2009, the AICPA responded, published what became known as the Trust Service Criteria, and the SOC, or Service Organization Control Audits, were created. But the last major update to these controls really dates back to 2017. So when I speak of a Rosetta Stone, it's to understand that the critical importance of clear communication, clear language, to assist you in helping you map some fairly arcane controls to modern cloud systems and processes is critical. Also having a clear compliance narrative to describe your IT systems from the outset is the foundation for producing clear use cases in your audit evidence, which is essential to pass any audit, SOC 2 or otherwise. This presentation is not a primer on SOC compliance. There is an assumption here that you understand various SOC compliance reports, the purpose of those reports. This presentation is intended to talk through some highlights. We're gonna go through a mock audit for those who have experienced or been exposed to at least SOC audits during some incarnation of your career. You may be here because you know that having SOC 2 attestation in the cloud puts you at a competitive advantage, can help you win and maintain customers, and it may just satisfy some internal and external stakeholders. And for those of you who want to move to cloud native applications, platforms, services, putting compliance and security at the front of the planning stage is a great approach. It's a great way to launch a design. So why now? Yes, SOC 2 certifications help build trust. It differentiates you from your peers and your competitors. But why are we hearing so much about it right now? Again, the trust service criteria of security, processing integrity, privacy, among others, are problems we're all tackling yet again in this new normal. A sudden shift to a highly remote workforce accelerated many organizations plans to move to the cloud quickly and quite frankly you know the audit is coming coming minimally you're having to work through documentation and processes again for stakeholders so with that said worst case scenario your approach you and your team haphazardly cobbled together enough to pass a one time and again that's a type one audit at a point in time and check a box to promote a perceived business value. But if you really wanna take the killing two birds with one stone approach, you would dig into this process, revisit security processes overall in this new normal and couch them in SOC 2 controls or your framework of choice really and bake compliance in as part of this journey. Another reason we, we hear so much about SOC 2, quite frankly, is the breadth of reporting. The breadth of reporting required to pass a SOC 2 audit is significant. And it really, it readies yourself in your organization as a good starting point for building structures which can produce audit evidence. And then this evidence can be repurposed and support a wide variety of compliance controls. So effectively, if you have audit evidence to pass SOC 2, you can often go right in and tackle, say, PCI DSS or NIST 853. SOC 2 is also, also often viewed as a business-to-business -business virtual handshake, acknowledging that a third party has come and reviewed and attested that you, as a service organization, who handles customer data, has processes, governance, policies, and monitoring in place, which ideally ensures that data is maintained, processed, transmitted, 
secured, stored, disposed of in accordance with the standards set forth by the AICPA. And finally, security is not an option in a SOC 2 audit. Of the SOC 2 principles or criteria, you can choose which principles to include in your SOC 2 audit, but security must be included in a non-privacy principle SOC 2 audit. So we're going to dig in and talk about that roadmap. Make sure you are clear on the shared responsibilities and who owns part or all of each control in this matrix. And make no mistake, this is the most crucial step in, to a successful audit. Note that the trust service criteria at the bottom availability, processing, integrity, et cetera. These are sets of controls individually and each box in the matrix would be responsible for producing audit evidence depending on the scope of the SOC 2 audit. So let me couch this in an example. Say for example, your organization uses AWS to host business to business workloads. And as part of your SOC 2 audit, in addition to security, which is required, you choose, say, availability and confidentiality as trust service criteria for those B2B servers. That's in scope of your audit. It would then, based on this matrix, be a joint effort to produce the audit evidence between you and AWS. It's important to note that while availability, these things are optional, understanding the who of responsible responsibility for producing audit evidence for the trust criteria and the how of the tr trust criteria will be evaluated upfront is really where the real work is. It, it, understanding this from the outset will improve the experience overall and the actual effectiveness of the audit. So looking at our mock SOC 2 type 1 audit, and again, a type 1 audit is a moment in time versus a type 2, which is an audit over a period of time. What is evaluated from a security criteria perspective in the SOC 2 audit? What are the required controls? In the common criteria, controls for communication and information have to be included. You must be able to illustrate how you manage, <clears throat> excuse me, internal and external communication and information flows. The common criteria for control activities have to be included. You have to demonstrate how you manage technology risk. In the common criteria for logical and physical access, you would demonstrate how you detect and prevent unwanted attacks and access to systems. You would demonstrate logical and physical security here. This is a shared activity likely between you and the cloud service provider for cloud native audits. The common criteria for system operations, also likely a shared responsibility between you and the CSP, would illustrate effective anomaly detection, incident response, and remediation tools. It also digs into effective governance around the communication of security events. And finally, in the common criteria for change management, you would demonstrate how you've implemented change, man change management and all of your policies related to software, infrastructure, and data. So if you aren't working with a governance framework and your goal is SOC 2 compliance, understanding that these are the criteria which will be evaluated is important. Or say you have a well-documented set of controls in an existing framework, this is where you would start in terms of mapping your controls to SOC 2 criteria. Or if you're just starting on your journey to the cloud and envisioning that path with these criteria up front is a wonderful place to start. So we'll dig into the high level roadmap and discuss the key elements required to pass a SOC 2 audit, regardless of where you are on your cloud native or compliance journey. So returning back to the control matrix, step one, 
building this out is the first step in, and can take some significant time and effort. Security in cloud native environments is intrinsically linked to understanding the who and the how of the service provider. Now keep in mind all of the public CSPs, the cloud service providers, especially recently have extensively expanded their offerings in regards to off the shelf tools. That's part of their service now around compliance, specifically for SOC 2 in the shared responsibility matrix boxes, don't reinvent the wheel. Look to your cloud service providers, see what's made available. For step two, once you've determined, now you need to determine the, the trust service criteria that you want to have in scope. We know security is going to be there. Best case scenario, this is not a check the box exercise, but an opportunity to set standards for compliance needs of the organization. Remember, you have to include security, but each one of these trust service criteria has its own sets of controls. Step three, perform a gap analysis. Implement remediation when necessary. Rinse, lather, repeat. Now keep in mind some key factors which is going to determine the number of times you cycle through these steps. And I think this is a real pain point for people who are going after SOC 2 audits, this rinse, lather, repeat. The scope, the scope of your audit is going to determine the number of iterations. The more trust service criteria you include, the more controls you're having to meet, which in turn means the production of more audit evidence and more test cases. Where are you with documented processes? Understanding that will determine whether or not you can already leverage an existing framework. If you're working with say COVID or CCM from the Cloud Security Alliance, you can likely lean into those. Many times these frameworks are based on industry accepted security standards and regulations. So a lot of SOC 2 controls are covered in those existing frameworks. Finally, the number of third parties you're working with can really impact the sizing, the number of cloud service providers, et cetera. Each control in the trust service criteria must be repeated for multi-tenancy. So multiple cloud service providers that you're working with for shared SOC 2 audits, multiple SOC 2 audit evidence and reports must be generated. And step four, ready your communication skills. Because successful audits are rooted in compelling compliance narratives. Remember, this is a certified public accountant auditing your system. How simple is your network diagram to an outsider? How easy right now is it to describe your endpoint detection and response? As you'll see as part of the final audit report, we're going to see a sample. It will include your opportunity to include your organization's compliance narrative. It will also include test cases and audit evidence. But leveraging some known frameworks can assist with the production of that audit evidence. Frameworks such as MITRE ATT&CK can assist in readiness against real world attack tactics and techniques, but can also help translate concepts like intrusion detection and prevention, as an example. Your auditor, your CPA, may be accustomed to being pointed to a piece of hardware during an, an audit for IDS. Very different kind of solution may be presented for IDS IPS and use cases around that in cloud native environments. So let's look at what is in an actual SOC 2 compliance report from an auditor's perspective. So at the top, you're going to see um, the service auditor's report. This is your CPA's executive summary of the audit. Next, this is where you come in. Your management team has the opportunity to document your compliance strategy. In their words, this is your management's executive summary. Next, you're going to see a description of the system. This is where any diagrams, workflows that are documented 
any end-to-end -end system narrative would be appropriate here. Next, there's going to be a section of tests and controls and corresponding results. Now, this literally could be volumes of data depending on the scope of the audit. Remember, more trust service criteria included, more use cases. If you have multiple CSPs or multiple third parties, that's going to you know, expand um, as well. And then lastly, any additional information you'd like to provide in the audit, potentially noting third party attestations that you have um, or supporting documentation for other folks you work with. Just as you would not necessarily have the appropriate background as an IT professional to say audit a complex financial statement, the onus is on the IT organization to demonstrate compliance even when the use case is unfamiliar to the CPA. And I wanna show you some real world examples of where this can become a challenge. You may have run into them yourselves. So the common criteria of section six speaks to the logical and physical security aspects of your system. You would need to be able to demonstrate how you detect and prevent unwanted attacks and access to systems. Now keep in mind the common criteria controls for section six have multiple facets each looking at a specific requirement, and sometimes it's even a shared responsibility. But fundamentally, how would your auditor expect to see how you meet this without a software-defined perimeter? How are you going to show like functionality? Another example, in Common Criteria 7, you would have to show how you would identify vulnerabilities or misconfigurations and how you do this on a periodic basis. Likely your auditor may be used to seeing a traditional antivirus solution here or anti-malware. The auditor may even know how to drive those test cases themselves. So your auditors are learning about cloud solutions just like IT professionals. But again, the onus is on the IT professional to be prepared and reduce confusion with clear test cases which illustrate how you meet these challenges. Be ready to answer any questions which may come up which are off script. So I've actually given, typed up a sample uh, SOC 2 audit to these specific areas. The first being um, around logical and physical access of the common criteria of section six, specifically around um, IDS. So in this section here, we would have the actual control listed. The control activity specified by the service organization. This is your narrative. This is how you are describing functionality in a cloud native world. See, use this as a a tutoring opportunity for your CPA, an introduction to how you're meeting IDS requirements, maybe in a way they've never seen before in a cloud native implementation. Leveraging um, tests that are defined by a framework like MITRE ATT&CK can readily demonstrate tactics and how they are prevented to the service auditor. And you see we pass with flying colors. So another example here was our second example around section, uh, the common criteria for section seven, um, looking at how we would manage changes to configurations that would result into the potential introduction of new vulnerabilities and susceptibilities. Here again, we would map out the control. We would read the very top is how um, the AI CPA requires the control. There, within the SOC 2 documentation, there are some guidelines of, of types of use cases that they would like to see. But again, you have an opportunity here to give your narrative of how you interpret this control and how you meet this control. And then you have use cases and test cases queued up that you can fire off quickly and easily to be able to turn this into a Q&A session with your auditor.
So having worked with auditors for a very long time, I would say a safe answer to every SOC 2 control in a cloud native world is to first consider how you would accomplish this in an on-premise infrastructure. Again, auditors, especially CPAs for SOC 2, and it does have to be a CPA to attest a, a SOC 2 um, certification. How would you accomplish this in an on-prem deployment? Get out your Rosetta Stone and then show like functionality in your cloud deployment. How you have an opportunity to provide a narrative and then generate basic use cases to support it. Because we're really already solving these problems right now. We're tackling SOC 2 trust service criteria every day. You're already doing the work. Why not couch these efforts in SOC 2 ready use cases? Some examples from May of 2020. Four months ago, we did not see this new normal coming. We now have a highly distributed workforce. We have, in some cases, a reduced response team and a spike in threats from all angles. So zero trust isn't just a framework we talk about anymore. It's, it is the new normal. So how are you going to demonstrate how you protect against unauthorized disclosure of information or an authorized access? I'm sure you're able to do it, but what's your use case? You've just set yourself up to meet at least one control in a SOC 2 audit. How are you going to explain to your auditor that you've actually enhanced accessibility and resilience by leveraging containers and microservices? What does that workflow diagram look like? How can you leverage an existing framework, moreover, to tell this story? Again, we're already doing the work. Take a look at the SOC 2 principles if it's a goal of yours and start building use cases accordingly. Including process integrity in a common criteria in terms of whether or not it's in scope can be a massive undertaking for organizations working with multiple third parties to contribute to a final product of a SOC 2 audit. But you need easy access to procedures and processes of those third parties anyway, if you say want to stay out of the headlines. Do you know that all, do you know all that you should about your third parties? who contribute to the care and feeding of infrastructure, data, and software right now. Confidentiality, new challenges here, working from home and now exposes physical security in a new way. Working from common spaces even for stable internet or power on some days, or simply having a laptop with sensitive data in a busy household brings new challenges um, of theft and damage, and likely you're talking about this within your organization. So how are you going to demonstrate how you handle confidential information in a highly distributed workforce? Hint, look at SOC 2 compliance controls. And finally, <laughs> privacy when failure really is not an option. Looking at the top 15 data breaches of the 21st century, so the past few months, alone has exposed over a billion records, resulted in millions in fines, and actually a couple of prison sentences. Also, the California Consumer Privacy Act, or CCPA, went into effect in Jan of 2020. If you're impacted by that, consumers can now opt out of the sale of their personal information and it's why you probably have seen an uptick in emails with updates to privacy terms in your inbox. In theory right now, every Californian can find out what information is being collected about them and their devices. Also in um, March 21st of this year, right in the middle of the height of the pa pandemic in New York, silently, the New York uh, Shield Act went into effect very similar to the CCPA, but it not only focuses on the protection of private information, but also seeks to enforce disclosure from organizations if they are breached. 
So our call to action today is to recognize, number one, you're tackling these problems already today. You're already working through these challenges, couching them in SOC 2 controls. You're, you can immediately start building out use cases. I would also recommend visiting our uh, Cloud Native Compliance Playbook strategies for how to uh, build both security and compliance in a cloud native world. And I've included a link uh, to that, present, to that uh, document in the presentation. And uh, I appreciate you joining me today and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Did I see questions come in? Uh, we haven't had questions since yet. Okay, all right. Uh, all right. Maybe I'll kick off a question here, which is, sure. what are the most um, common types of compliance standards that you're seeing in the cloud native deployments of, you know, early cloud? Is it, how does, how often do you see SOC 2 versus PCI, DSS versus others? I think we're hearing so much, right now, the most I'm, I'm hearing SOC 2 in a new, with a new kind of volume. And again, it, it's because it's such a broad compliance standard. It, it applies to anyone who, who holds customer data, holds or manages customer data. Um, so I'd say SOC 2 right now, it, it, the reason I chose it as an example is the one I'm hearing about the most. Obviously, depending on your, um, you know, area of expertise in terms of your organization that you're supporting, it could be HIPAA, it could be PCI, it could be GDPR. Um, privacy could be a, a major issue, but again, SOC 2 is talked about a lot because if you can pass a SOC 2 audit because of the breadth of controls and the size of the audit, you often can reuse that evidence to, to pass, say, PCI or, or NIST. But it really depends on, on your industry. It could be FedRAMP that's driving you as well. Sounds good, thank you. Folks, feel free to chime in and or you can type in your questions on the Q&A box. I think uh, compliance will continue to grow as an important area of uh, that needs more you know, attention and innovation in the cloud native world. Uh, so you want to stay out of the headlines, yep. Yeah, I guess there's a question from Vipin here. Is this information, is, is this, I guess, referring to your playbook or your Rosetta Stone guide or whatever, is this available for all platforms like VMware, OpenStack, AWS, and Azure? Can this playbook and this information be used in a multi-cloud platform? A hundred percent, and it's actually a wonderful question. And if I wasn't clear in the presentation, it actually is critical um, that matrix, our step number one, understanding what you have in the cloud, first of all, maybe you have multiple things in the cloud across multiple cloud service providers. If you want to pass a SOC 2 audit, understanding that matrix of the who and the how of the cr trust criteria, who's going to produce the audit evidence? Is it a joint effort? Um, for example, if you are leveraging you're trying to get a SAS application, SOC 2 certification or attestation. Um, it's really a joint effort, very heavy on the joint effort. Right now, and actually as of this month, um, Microsoft has a whole new section of off the shelf SOC 2 ready reports. So the joint area that they would be responsible, those reports are just, you can download them today and you can actually use them to model how you would report on your responsibilities. But yes, that is what would increase the scope of the audit and the time it would take to do the audit because you would have to meet the criteria for each one of those public cloud providers as well as yourself, depending on that trust service criteria, you know, the matrix and, and who and how you're going to produce the audit evidence. Um, another question is, uh, you touched on SOC 1 and SOC 2. What is the difference between the two? Sure. Type 1 is a, a moment in time. So it would be that day. It would be like a snapshot of or, you know, maybe that week. 
A SOC two, a type two audit typically runs for six months. So you would kick off the timer, you would start to collect information um, over a period of time. So in our example for IDS IPS, um, we would want to be able to provide not just the use cases that we triggered, you know, as an example for the auditor at that point in time, but we would have to show how we protected in say the real world for a period of months. Um, Kevin asks, where is a good place to get a full breakdown of the control criteria? Uh, mm -hmm. He's finding that uh, the finding this on the EICPA website is a bit difficult. Um, sure, actually, if you download this presentation, there are some hyperlinks and there is a link directly to the PDF, which maps out all of these controls. And you're right, there's multiple PDFs, but there is a single one. And again, we're talking a lot about the Rosetta Stone because it's from 2017, right? It doesn't necessarily map easily to cloud native concepts and principles, but it is from 2017. It's a single PDF and there's a link to it in this, this presentation. Um, another question is, uh, what is the process, overall process of a third party assess assessment? It's a great question. So this can be incredibly overwhelming, obviously. Um, and depending on the scope of your audit, again, if you're just going after the MVP, just tackling uh, the security principles to include, or if, you're, if you have to, for example, report on data processing integrity, it's not uncommon to um, leverage a consultant. There's a lot of folks out there. There's even compliance as a service now. You know, in the past year, that's, that's come up as an offering. Um, but it's, it's not uncommon to have a third party come in and help you um, map some of these controls, help you build use cases, really work and break down that um, uh, responsibility matrix. But to be completely clear, the only people they can give you SOC 2 attestation. And this is different than say PCI or NIST or FedRAMP where you can enlist a third party, you know, a group of auditors to come in like Deloitte, for example, to sign the piece of paper or Deloitte's not a good example, um, Joe's compliance shop, you know, just someone who does this for a living. You can't do that necessarily for SOC 2 unless Joe is a certified public accountant. It must be a CPA. And by extension, can any CPA do this? If they know how, yes. Okay. But, and, and that's the challenge, right, is, is finding those CPAs who really have one foot in the technical world. Um, it's, it, it can be challenging. You know, the big four all have them on staff, but not everyone can afford a big four auditor. So, um, really comes down to how well you can work with that auditor, how clear you can make your compliance um, narrative to that auditor. A uh, couple more questions coming up in the chat window. Please put your questions in the Q&A box, please. Uh, Brahmin asks, can you design a customized OS in the control matrix? I'm not entirely sure about the question. Can you design a customized OS in the control matrix? Um, yeah, no, I, I understand what you're asking. Um, of course you can, um, it, but th that's work, right? That's a lot of work. And that's where the monster under the bed feeling comes from. Um, you know, I would suggest downloading the PDF from the AICPA. Uh, if you're using an existing framework right now, like um, if you are making sure you have coverage, say for MITRE or COBIT, um, you know, that is a pretty easy exercise of mapping controls, but yeah, I mean, you would have to, if you are using a custom OS to host um, customer information, absolutely, you, you can do it, it's work. You would have to do it if you wanted to get a SOC 2 attestation. Um, Kyle asks, what do consumers of SOC 2s, or I guess the SOC 2 reports, really look for in the reports? consumers. So your consumers would be 
in this case, it's not going to be, you know, the person who's buying your product. They really just want to see that you have the attestation, that you've had a third party come in and say, yes, they, they really are doing what they say they can do. Um, your consumer would likely be a business partner or, or someone you would want to, um, you know, leverage as a, um, or you're the third party and you want to work with a larger organization. It really just shows that your business is in order, that you really have done diligence around security. Um, it's that virtual handshake that I was talking about. But honestly, I, I would be surprised if anyone opened up um, a SOC 2 report. They may want, except around privacy. Now, I think um, privacy principled SOC 2 attestations you really might start to see some folks dig in and see what the chain of custody is for how you um, collect, um, especially with these latest regulations in California and New York, what you're collecting, how it's being stored, how it's being um, destroyed. Um, there would be probably some significant scrutiny around that if it was a privacy principle SOC 2. Sounds good. I think that's about all the questions we have. Uh, we'll wait a minute more if anybody has any more last questions. Yes, there's one more now. Kyle asks again, what would happen if I have to issue a qualified report after issuing them regularly without issue? Are there things I can do to give customers comfort over our environment? Well, I think that's kind of a subjective question, but um, it, comfort over your environment. I think right now, privacy is at the forefront of most people's thoughts. That's why we're seeing uh, regulations like GDPR, the acts in California and New York come forward. Um, you, again, you can show pretty readily um, you wouldn't want to disclose any confidential operational information, but you could you could make clear statements that you are disposing of co consumer information in a specific way. And that specific way is spelled out in the privacy principles for SOC 2. And it really, um, it's quite rigorous. And I think if you were able to say SOC 2 at the you know, SOC 2 certified for privacy and you dealt with consumer information, you could have a link maybe to the section of the AICPA website um, to show exactly what that means in terms of if you put your information into systems that collect data. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, so I think we are about done here. Thank you, Cynthia, for a great presentation. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's going to be, yeah, go ahead, Cynthia. No. Just thank you for, for having me. And uh, the webinar recording and the slides will be online later today. We'll be looking forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Uh, stay safe. Have a great day. Goodbye. You as well. Bye-bye.